Hey everyone, episode 93, coming at you in the flesh from your host, Rachel and co host Oh my God, <laughs> I was saying your host, Rachel, as in I'm telling the story and you're the co-host today, but like we're both co-hosts. Oh, you thought you ran the show? Yeah, I'm not trying to take the limelight here, but just for today's episode, because I am telling you my story, you know? Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. For those on YouTube who are watching us, um, I'm in a closet because <laughs> <laughs> sound quality, it's sound quality is way better in here. And that's why it looks like that. My unfinished closet, but there's wall to wall carpet. I just think it's better for the pod if I'm in here, you know? It is better. Way better, actually. I'll make it cute then. This will be my new studio. Yeah. You need a ring light. You need, um, mm. you know, just make, just make it yours. I'm going to make it my own. Good idea. There's one more thing. Oh, what? Uh, I was just going to tell you this cool fact I learned about Lucille Ball yesterday. Oh, well, hold on. Before you do that, I want to address one review we got. Very nice. Very good review. But she said that we have far more bonus episodes than regular episodes. Patrons respectfully disagree, I'm sure. And (laughs) Apple subscribers. Yeah, patrons and Apple subscribers respectfully disagree. But we only release bonus episodes once a month. We have 21 total. And this is episode 93 of our regular episodes. So we don't have more bonus. Here's what I think you're doing if you're on Apple, which she said uh, that the review is on Apple. So I know she's on Apple or he. I don't know. I think you're filtered to unplayed. So if you're binging it, all the bonus episodes probably are at the top and you're having to scroll to find one that you haven't listened to yet. So you could unfilter that and then sort by newest to oldest or oldest to newest, whichever direction you're binging. And then you'll see the ones you likely haven't listened to. I'm actually glad you said that because someone else pointed that out to us when I read that review out loud. And I thought the same thing about Nothing Much Happens, which is a sleep podcast that I highly recommend. It sends you right to sleep. But I was, I've been like, what, did she upload every single bonus episode with no post-dated date? Because all of them are at the top. And I was like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling until I got to something that I know I hadn't heard. And then when I read that review, I went to my Apple podcast and I was filtered to unplayed. Show so, enough. Show yeah. enough. So I think that's what you're doing. We, I assure you, we do not have more bonus episodes, unfortunately, than regular episodes. We are a vastly free podcast. The bonus is just a little, a little monthly fee. So I, I get it. But th- I think that's what you're doing. Just a heads up. If, if anyone else is in that boat, there's your PSA. You're filtered to unplayed. Should I tell you about Lucille Ball? Oh, yeah. Tell me. I don't even know what you're talking about, girl. I was watching the show yesterday. And apparently, Lucille during World War II, in mm-hmm. 1942, Lucille Ball was driving home from a movie set or something. For those who don't know, Lucille Ball. If you, if you know the show I Love Lucy from the 50s, some people might not. I don't know. Oh. Lucille Ball's in it. She's, you know, insanely a, famous. She's a very like, famous old yeah. actress right Whatever. she's dead now but you know F- uh, funny funny funny, <laughs> funny gal uh she was driving home from a mo- movie studio or something and she started hearing m- really loud music and so she yeah. went to turn off the radio and the radio was already off so she was like am i going crazy and it turned out it was coming she was like i th- really think it's coming from my mouth and she was like what, what the hell is this no so then it stopped she got home she's like i'm going outside my mom and the next day at the movie set, she like told her, her actor friend, and he was like, oh, actually, I know someone that's happened to. Did you recently go to the dentist? Because his fa- his filling was like picking up radio waves. And she was like, yeah, I did just get a filling. She's like, now that you say that, the street I was going down was on a radio, was where a radio station is. So yeah, I was picking it up. That's weird. And so then a few days later or something, it happened again. But this time it wasn't music. It was like tapping. And she was like, oh, shit, this sounds like Morse code. So she oh called authorities, she contacted the authorities, and they searched the area, and sure enough, in a basement of a house, they found an underground radio station run by Japanese spies. No. Yeah. No. Lucy helped capture spies, or her dentist did. Whatever. <laughs> or her dentist did. Isn't oh. that crazy? Is that real? Yeah. I'm going to have to Google that when we're done. Do it. 1942. Whoa. Isn't that crazy? I was like, wow. Me and Bear were both like, holy shit. That's, that's some shit. Is that well-known? That should be more well-known. Well, I bet if you're a Lucille Ball fan, it is. Yeah, I guess. Oh, my God. 
I'm literally like, if it were one week later, I'd be like, that was an April Fool's joke. Chill. Uh, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Jokes on me. That'd be a weird one. <laughs> That'd be a hilarious one. Well, that's great. Thanks yeah. for sharing. No problem. Okay. I'm going to tell y'all about Latrice Curtis. Sources. A medium article by Fatim Hemraj. I'll say the title at the end. Oh. <laughs> it would very much give it away. Okay. Uh, the case file, Cinemaholic, WRAL.com. They covered every single detail of this. So I had like 10 art articles from them. On the morning of January 30th, 2008, police in Raleigh, North Carolina, got a call that there was an unresponsive person on the side of Interstate 540. When they got to the scene, they found a young woman, clearly dead. She was very pale and there was blood everywhere. Her car was parked on the side of the interstate and they found blood on the driver's side door, so they concluded that she was attacked while still in her car and then forced out. Police ran the plate and discovered that the car was registered to 21-year-old Latrice Curtis. Later, an autopsy revealed that she had been stabbed almost 40 times in her neck, stomach, chest, and head. And she had a condom inside of her. Ooh. As they're processing the scene, a man runs up and tries to get to the car. Police stop him and he tells them that his name is Darren Curtis he was driving around looking for his wife, Latrice, because she didn't come home the night before and the car parked off to the side looked a lot like hers. Darren then looks at the blue tarp that police used to cover her body and says, please tell me she's not under there. And then she, he shows the cop that he's talking to a picture of Latrice and they say, sadly, it is her. Oh. Now I'll go into a little bit more about Latrice. She was born in 1986 in Raleigh, North Carolina. She was one of four kids with two, two brothers and a sister. In 2006, she was studying accounting at Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's where she met Darren Curtis. Darren was five years older than her, and he was in the National Guard. The two started dating, and after about a year in 2007, they got married when she was only 21 years old. She was only a junior in college. Whoa. How know. old? And he was five years older? Yeah, he's five years older. Latrice's friends described Darren as reserved but sweet and respectful. However, her dad, Sherman, disagreed. He was really upset they got married considering how young she was, and especially since Darren never asked for her hand uh, in marriage. He, mm -mm. he never did the permission thing. Ooh. That's a big no in the South. Big no, no. You asked the dad. Yeah. Which some people hate. <laughs> some people hate, sure. I think it's sweet. I do, I do too, kind of. But, you know, some... Like fem big hardcore feminists are like, uh, it's my life, which I, I get that too. But it well, is a it's tradition. just a respectful thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like, do I have your blessing? Not can I have her, which I think is <laughs> right. what it pretty much used to be. Can we transfer the ownership deed from you to me? <laughs> right. Here, sign here. After the wedding, Darren and Latrice moved to Durham, North Carolina, and she transferred to North Carolina Central University or NCCU, as I'll call it moving forward. So she transferred there to finish her degree. Now fast forward to January 30th and the scene on the, side, on the side of the interstate when they discover her body. Obviously, the husband's the first one they look at. Sure. So they bring Darren in for questioning. He tells them that the night of January 29th, a few hours before her murder, Latrice called him saying she was leaving class around 10 p.m. and she was running late. NCCU, where she went to school, is in Durham. They lived in Raleigh. It's like a little bit more than 30 minutes away. Yeah. So she told him she was going to get something to eat and then would head back. Okay. So her class didn't end at 10, right? God, that's late. Well, she, she called when she was leaving. I don't know if she was leaving class or class had already been over, yeah. but she just said, I'm going to be later than normal. I'm going to get something to eat. I'll uh, head okay. home after that. Okay. She still wasn't home when Darren went to bed at 1130, but he thought she may have ended up staying at her parents' house. I think they lived closer to the school. So he was like, mm. It's not that weird. When he woke up the next morning and she still wasn't there, he was concerned, so he called her, and it went straight to voicemail. Then he called her parents to see if she was there, and when they said she wasn't, he called police to file a missing persons report and then got in his car to go look for her. As he's driving along I-540, he saw a bunch of police, and in the middle of it was a car that looked like Latrice's. That's when he pulled over and ran up to the cop. Oh, God. Can that you imagine? To my boss. What? That happened to my boss and her son. What? Well, it wasn't a homicide. It was a car wreck. He missed curfew and it was like 3 a.m. So she went out looking for him <gasps> and came across the car and the cops. <gasps> oh, my God. I just got chills. He died. Was he? He wasn't. No, he died. <gasps> he 
I know. Her Your only son. Boss. No. No. My old one. The one who actually, um, in the previous episode, I told you all about how she um, hitchhiked in college. Oh, yeah. And the car wouldn't stop. She started f- freaking out, crying, whatever. And then they turned around, took her to her requested location and just said, this is why you don't get in the car with the hitchhiker. He was trying to teach her a lesson. A good, tough lesson is what I'm telling you. And it worked because she never hitchhiked again. But yeah, her. Oh, Mm. no. That makes me so so sad. So sick. Darren was cooperative and gave DNA, but he didn't have an alibi. He said he was just at home alone asleep. Oh, yeah. Which does not an alibi make Mm -mm. Brian Koberger's defense team. (laughs) No, sorry. Sorry. Late night drives. Does not count as an alibi unless someone is with you. Right. The car is the alibi. So they let him go, but he is nowhere near cleared yet. The police are not the only ones who were sus of Darren. Latrice's family was convinced he had something to do with it. Her dad, Sherman, said that the day they found her body, he was trying to get in touch with her, especially since Darren called that morning being like, is Latrice there? She's not at home. They're like, oh, shit. So they were trying to get in touch with her, too. He was also trying to get in touch with Darren after that, being like, did you find her what's the latest then later that morning he saw on the news that a body was found on the side of the road and police contacted him soon after that that news story was released and said that it was latrice sherman offered to come identify her just to make sure and they told him that darren already did earlier that morning so they're oh like god why the hell did dare not call us to tell us oh yeah no that's so sketchy. they did not like that yeah they were very suspicious of him right As word got out about Latrice, her friend Kimberly came forward and told police that she got a call from Latrice around 2 a.m. and it woke her up, so she answered. But no one was talking. All she could hear was wind, what sounded like footsteps on gravel, and cars passing. She's like yelling her name. She did not get an answer. uh, So they're certain this was around the time she was probably killed. Oh, my God. It was probably the killer trying, like, about to go dispose her cell phone somewhere, but he (laughs) butt-dialed. Yeah. (gasps) She could hear the interstate. Yeah. A few hours later, cops got a huge tip. After seeing a bulletin asking for more information on Latrice's murder, a trooper with the North Carolina Highway Patrol named Isaac Cooper contacted investigators and told them that around 1.15, 1.30 a.m. on January 30th, he was driving on I-540 and stopped at the location where Latrice's body was found because he noticed two cars parked off to the side. One was a minivan. The keys were in the ignition and it was on, but no one was in there. Oh, my God. The second car was a white sedan that was parked on the opposite side of the interstate. Both of them had their hazards on, but he could not find anyone. Oh, he was pulling over to be a good Samaritan? No, he's a trooper. He's like, oh, what the going on? <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. He's like, no, what are y'all doing? doing? Because it's his job. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, was, I forgot that he was a cop. Right. The trooper looked around the cars for anyone to explain what the hell was going on, mm-hmm. but no one was there. And then he got called on his radio to tend to something else. So he had to leave. But before he left, he ran the plates. Sure. So he saw that the white sedan was registered to Latrice. Mm-hmm. And the minivan was registered to Robert Reeves. Okay. Who that? Who that? They look into Robert Reeves. He is a 43-year-old minister at Cedar International Fellowship in Durham. He lived in Durham with his sister, Willie Mae Thorpe, who I just love. Everyone called him the bishop because he was a bishop. Sure. Everyone's so creative. I know. I was about to say, that's creative. They were like, who the hell's this and what's his connection to Latrice? So they called him in for questioning, and he confirms that it is his car, but he doesn't know why it was parked there. He went to church around 8 p.m. on January 29th, but his roommate slash tenant, not Willie Mae, a guy who rented his basement apartment, often used his van and he didn't require him to have like to ask for permission. He even had his own key. So he was like, he may have taken it. Oh God. So they're like, great. Who rents your basement apartment? And he says, Stephen Randolph. Okay. So who the hell is Stephen Randolph? Stephen was originally from Baltimore and he was on the basketball team at NCCU. He worked at a local car wash and I guess Robert was a customer of the car wash So one day they were chatting and Stephen mentioned that he was about to be evicted from his apartment. So Robert offered him the basement apartment for $300 a month, which was far cheaper than his apartment. So Stephen was amped, said sure. So that's why he lives with this 43-year-old minister. Oh, wow. I'd be like, well, why are you getting evicted, though? 
first. <laughs> I know. Are you going to pay rent or what? Yeah. What's the problem here? So it's sort of roommate, sort of a tenant landlord sitch. So yeah. That's... Stephen and Latrice met in one of their classes, and he was described as a ladies' man. He had a girlfriend named Velma, but despite of that, and despite Latrice being newly married, the two started having an affair. Mm. It's so this she's is twenty-one. Yeah, she's just young, man. Mm-hmm. She needs her college experience. Yeah. So Robert tells police about the affair, and he says when he left for church that night, Latrice's white sedan was parked there. So he figured that she and Stephen were down in the basement apartment. This was also confirmed by Robert's sister, Willie May, who said that Latrice's car was there when she got home that night around 9 p.m. Obviously, the fact that she's having an affair was of great interest to investigators. Sure. A a love triangle is often the the motive for murder. And this is actually love square with Uh Latrice, Darren, Stephen, and Velma. They're both. Oh, right. Velma. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. Police looked at Latrice's call log on her phone and saw that there was a lot of activity from one phone number the night of January 29th and into the early morning hours of January 30th. Sure enough, that's Stephen's phone number. On February 1st, 2008, they called Stephen in for questioning. He admitted to the relationship with Latrice, saying that he knew she was married, but she told him they were separated. He said the night before her murder on January 29th, 2008, Latrice did go over to the apartment. They did have sex. And when they were done, they realized that the condom was stuck. The condom came off and was stuck inside of her. Ew. They tried to get it out, but couldn't. So Latrice left around 10 p.m. and Stephen headed to Velma's house. And he was, like, sort of freaking out. Stephen was? Yeah. I'm, like, I need I know we don't have time to process it because no one wants to hear us in silence. But uh, that's a lot. What? What? How does that happen? I know. I wondered that, too. You bought Magnums and you're not a Magnum. (laughs) I'm like, get better fitting condoms? I don't know. I don't know. But that's why the autopsy, I already said that they found a condom inside of her. Well, I know. Yeah. I I just thought it was a stupid or lazy rapist trying to get out of there or something. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, God. No. So that's why she had the condom inside of her. While he was at Velma's, Latrice called him and told him that she wanted to take the relationship to the next level. And he said, we'll discuss it next time we see each other. Stephen left Velma's and got back home around 1.30 a.m. on January 30th. He said he had set the house alarm and then went to bed. When he woke up the next morning, he had a missed call from Latrice at, at around 2 a.m. Oh. He also tells him about some weird chain of events that had been happening since he started seeing Latrice. Oh, shit. Starting in October 2007, he started getting threatening phone calls from a block number. He said the caller was a man. He sounded young and said he would break Stephen's legs and end his basketball career. He also said things like, I hope you have a gun, just shit like that. Mm -hmm. Then his girlfriend Velma started getting phone calls too. Oh, shit. The caller told her to tell Stephen to stop what he's doing, I guess, insinuating about the affair with Latrice. These calls went on for months and even started escalating. In December 2007, Stephen was at Velma's house and had been getting the same harassing phone calls they both were. The same night, the bishop, Robert, called him and said someone was ringing the doorbell, and every time he answered it, the person was gone. Classic ring ring and run sitch. Totally. So Stephen went to leave Velma's house to see what the F was going on, and when he walked out there, all four of his tires were slashed. Oh, my God. A few days later, Velma got a call from the man saying, I slashed your tires. Sorry. She went out to check, and sure enough, all four of her tires were slashed. Well, what the hell did Velma do? God. Who knows? She's, her boyfriend's cheating on her, and you're just kicking her while she's down? That's, I know. Jeez. So police are like, that's interesting. Latrice's boyfriend and his other girlfriend are being harassed in the months leading up to Latrice's murder. Perhaps her husband, Darren, found out about the affair and was essentially taking matters into his own hands. Right. But that doesn't explain the van being there. Yeah. So another theory is maybe Latrice was taking too much of a liking to Stephen, especially when she called saying, I want to take it to the next level. And he freaked out and just wanted to make the whole thing disappear. He also told a friend the night the condom got stuck, like he was very upset about it because, I mean, I guess that's a slightly big pregnancy risk. Oh, okay. A condom is rendered useless if it comes off during sex, is what I'm saying. Yes. So he was nervous. So they're like, that's another very good motive. 
Yeah. That's another very possible motive. None of it's good motive. Not, not, there's not a good motive to no. kill anyone. So. No. So like Darren, Stephen is cooperative, gave DNA, but also like Darren, he is nowhere near cleared. And these two become the main suspects, mm -hmm. her husband and her boyfriend. Sure. That didn't last for long because on February 2nd, 2008, Bishop Robert Reeves is arrested <gasps> and charged with first degree murder. I thought it was going to be Velma. Oh. Mm. Oh, my God. The hell's his problem? You really didn't know? No. Great. Here's what led them to Robert. Oh, my God. As investigators continue to talk to Stephen, they learn more about his living situation. One day, a few months prior to the murder, he and Robert were talking, I think, about money specifically and how Stephen did not have much of it. Uh-huh. And Robert asked him if he's ever considered being a male escort. Oh, my God. And Stephen was like, no, I haven't considered it. And when Robert told him that sometimes the clients are male, Stephen was like, no, then not my thing. Robert asked Stephen if he's ever received oral sex from a man, and that's when Stephen realized that Robert was hitting on him. Sure. He made it very clear that was not going to happen. Robert apologized, but that was not the end of it. Mm -hmm. He brought it up a few more times, trying to convince Stephen by telling him that getting a blowjob from a man doesn't make you gay. It doesn't matter if a woman does it or a man does it. It's just, and he's like, stop. He also offered Stephen free rent if he <gasps> let him do it. Stephen continued to reject him and even borrowed his cousin's nine millimeter gun just in case. Oh my God. They looked more into Robert's past and found out that when he started his career as a preacher in South Carolina in the 80s, he was forced to leave the church after being accused and convicted of sexual assault on a boy under seven, the age of 17. Ew. This happened again a few mm -hmm. years later at a church in New York. What? So two sexual assault charges on minors. A man of the Lord. So police are like, whoa, 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 Miss Lippy. Right. Let's look into this guy again. They get a search warrant for his phone and learn that he has three phones, a house phone, a cell phone, and another phone, cell phone that they refer to as the fun phone that he used for play. Oh, my God. Phone records from the fun phone showed that on December 1st, 2007, six calls were made to Velma and several, I don't know how many exactly, were made to Steven. It also showed that the day Steven's tires were slashed, all seven of the block calls he got were from the fun phone. Oh, my God. They learned that the alarm system at Robert's house was armed on January 30th at 1.28 a.m., which is consistent with what Stephen said. He said he got home from Velma, set the alarm, went to bed around 1.30. So that corroborates that. Yeah, that checks out. That checks out. When Stephen said he got home that night, he didn't notice if Robert's car was in the driveway or not. He had no idea. I'm guessing with the amount of harassment, he just, like, puts his head down and runs to the basement oh, when I'm he gets sure. home. Or he has a separate entrance to the basement. Yeah. So Stephen does have a, his own car? Yeah. Or Velma dropped him off or something? Okay. Yeah, he does. <sighs> Robert. But an hour later, after Stephen set the alarm at 1.28 a.m., an hour later at 2.30 a.m., the alarm was triggered, and four seconds later, it was disarmed by someone using the master code. Stephen oh. had his own separate code and didn't know the master code. Only Robert knew the master code. So he was very likely the one who triggered it and then turned it off at 2.30 a.m., but he told investigators he got home at 11 or 11.30 that night. Mm -hmm. So they're like, no, you didn't. They also oh. spoke to several people, including Willie May, who said Robert was not at church that night. Oh. They also found a partially melted trash can at Robert's house that contained accelerant and fabric, which they later de determined to be clothes. It looked like he tried to burn clothes. Lastly, most of the DNA from the blood found in Latrice's car was hers, but there was an unidentified profile in the mix. They compared it to Stephen and Darren's, and they were not a match, but they couldn't exclude Robert. I don't know if it was too mixed. I don't know why it wasn't definite. They just couldn't exclude him. It was, yeah. it was not a no, but it wasn't a hard yes. Touch DNA from the steering wheel, though, was confirmed to be his. And the, I think it wasn't enough blood on the side of the car for the trooper who pulled over to notice it. I kept trying to find that. I'm like, if he was, like, shining his flashlight and stuff, did he not oh, see right. blood? Or... She hadn't been killed yet. I don't know yeah. where they would have been. Right. But I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. When Robert was arrested, people in the community were shocked, especially those who knew him from church. One article said that many of his colleagues and fellow churchgoers did not believe it, and they were certain he'd be exonerated, while others were far more, more concerned about his sexuality. No. <laughs> they were 
Are you serious? They're like, oh no, he's being accused of murder. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's Wait. gay? Hold on. Oh no, he may have murdered someone. Wait, he's what? Oh my God. That is so stupid. Oh my God. Well, now he's going to go to hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, God. That's just wrong. Yeah. They yada yada over murder. His trial started in September 2009. Prosecutors said he had be become obsessed with Stephen, and when Latrice came into the picture, he just snapped. After she left Stephen's house on January 29th, Robert followed her, forced her to pull over, and then attacked her. The defense argued that back in New York in his younger days, Robert was stabbed in his left arm while being mugged. Classic 80s New York. Sure. Because of that, his arm was half paralyzed, as the case file put it. He couldn't carry anything too heavy. He couldn't grip things really well. He didn't have much use for it. So it would have been really hard to viciously attack someone. But she was stabbed. I mean, he would just use his good arm. I don't know. Right. It's not. He has a knife. She probably has nothing. But They I mean, also yeah. noticed during questioning that he had a lot of scratches on his arms oh. and he said it was from moving a table and they asked Willie Mae about it and there, and she was like, I don't think he got hurt moving a table. Well, how, yeah. He, how would you get scratches on your, the I table mean, scratched you? I don't know. Whatever. It's one of those tables with a bunch of needles sticking out of it. <laughs> it was my knife table. <laughs> it was the knife table. Got it. The defense also implied that a knife found in Robert's car right after the crime was planted there by police and pointed, pointed out that it was never tested and that it didn't match the type of knife that the experts thought may have been used on Latrice. So I think they're like, the prosecutors are pointing out that there's a knife in the car that they found, but it's just a knife. It's unrelated. However, they did think the blade, I think they thought the blade of the knife found in the car was too short compared to the wounds on Latrice. But I read that that could be kind of altered with force. Like a smaller knife could look a lot bigger if you're forcefully stabbing someone. Oh, God. Yeah. Ugh. And so screw this. Fine. Okay. But it was still found in the car of your clients. <laughs> what are you talking about? Who cares if it was a separate knife? Your, the, your client was there. His car uh, was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So he used a knife. separate knife. Okay. So, yeah. Maybe that wasn't it. Maybe it was just happened to be a knife in the car. He brought his back up and he didn't um, end up using it. Well, your client is at the scene though. Well, they're, they're trying to paint it that the van was at the scene because Steven took the car. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. So, well, right. so what if he had a knife in his car? He wasn't the one driving his car that night. Right. Okay. The prosecution called several other men to testify with similar stories about Robert coming on to him. One was another basement apartment tenant who Robert let live there free, then eventually brought up the conversation of being an escort and getting and receiving oral sex from a man. I said getting and receiving, but you get it. Mm -hmm. um, when the guy refused, Robert all of a sudden started charging him rent. <laughs> God, this guy's a predator. I mean, beyond. The other, this blew my mind. The other person who testified with a similar story was a technician who was installing Robert's house alarm. Ew. What? <laughs> You're like, just hitting on everyone. This is when, this happened when Steven lived there. The technician came in to install the house alarm. And when he walked in, Robert was wearing a nice suit and Steven was leaving for class. 15 minutes later, Robert went to change into his sleeveless undershirt and shorts and started talking to the technician about sex. Robert then told him that he'd make a great escort. He's just like, oh my God, really on the escort kick. Then he asked the guy about the size of his penis. What? Then yet again, asked if he's ever received oral sex from a man. The technician became very uncomfortable. And Why? Said, I'm out. <laughs> what a prude. <laughs> he said, I'm out of here. And when he went to shake Robert's hand, Robert tried to pull him in the bathroom. Stop. This poor technician is like, I, I had contractors and, and people installing shit for months in my house. And we do not go beyond pleasantries. <laughs> I mean, like, how did this conversation start? What even the creep? small talk is hard. How oh. are you like, how big's your penis? Oh my God. This guy is a predator. He's a dirt bag. Ew. <laughs> Poor technicians, like, it's like I just, look. I really just want to install this and get the hell out of here. Right. And you know what? I don't need this job. This Please. isn't worth, this all of a sudden isn't worth it. No. Fuck uh, your house alarm. I yeah. hope you get robbed. I hope someone breaks in. Sure. 
After a two week trial and two days of deliberation, Robert was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that's where he remains today. Oh, I cannot wait to Google him. So poor Darren Curtis really did just happen upon the crime scene. Oh, God. I read that part and I was like, that's sketchy. No, yeah. that's really how he found out. Just driving around. Well, he knew her route. And if it's, I know. Yeah. The um, Medium article I sourced was newlywed college student murdered by her secret lover's pastor. Some Medium articles are like the Lifetime movie titles. I mean, that's they a great just tell you everything. One. I mean, it was a good article, but I was like, well, I can't read that title. Oh, my God. That's the really sad story of Latrice Curtis. Did they not... He got in trouble twice before as a <laughs> priest. Because yeah. remember that art. Remember that news that came out about a priest. It was in Georgia, outside of Atlanta, where a little girl was murdered in like the seventies, and it just went unsolved until kind of recently, within the past couple of years. And obviously, he's a old old man now. But it was some priest who actually, I think, came from New York and then Georgia and whatever. And he got in trouble in New York, came to Georgia. I'm like, do y'all not? Are they not background chat? Are there like? I feel like that is all, if it's a priest, they've had, they've been in trouble in the past. I'm like, why are you associated? How do you get associated with the new church if you're, I don't know. I don't know if it'd be common for a church to do a background check. If That's true. I guess that, you're coming from discretion. another church too. Or but give that church, the former church, a little ring. Dial yeah. him up. How I was know. he? Well, and it's like there's, you know, a big focus on forgiveness. Like, maybe he's changed. I actually do think I read one person associated with Robert Reeves that they did think he had changed because now this story takes place in 2008. His conviction was in the 80s. So I think they were just like, he's grown out of it. That phase of his life is over. That's over. He's (laughs) done being a predator. Did he serve time in prison for those first um, he was convicted, I don't know. you said. Oh, he was. God. I don't know if he, I mean, he was definitely forced to leave the church. I don't know what the actual punishment was. I think he did spend a little time in jail. And that just unraveled his desires. He's, he's taught, he's, he's a new career. man. Yeah, totally. God. Ask that technician. Right. Oh my God. God. It's like, oh God. Gross. All right. Now, Patreon shout outs. What up? Thanks for joining Laurel, Tiffany, Jordan, Robin, Catherine. Devin, Rachel, Jill, Amy, Margaret Ann, hey girl, Chris, that's it, (laughs) and Chris, (laughs) and Chris, thanks everyone, y'all, thank y'all so much for joining, so now I have custom shout outs, all right, first custom shout out is from Colleen, happy birthday Anna, thank you for being such a good friend, I don't know what I would do without you, and I hope I never have to find out. I hope this is your best birthday li- yet. Oh, that's nice. That is nice. You'll never have to find out. Don't worry. Um, my second one is from Tiffany. I'd like to shout out my bestie, Gabby. Y'all are being so nice to your friends. Oh, my God. Okay. I'd like to shout out my bestie, Gabby. We geek over true crime together all the time, and I just introduced People Are the Worst to her. She's literally my soulmate and best friend form and the best god mom to my baby, a.k.a. my dog, Nala Roo. I heart you, buddy. That is so nice. Um, tell your other friends, too, but you'll be in trouble for that shout out because you clearly like her the best. <laughs> but you still have to tell your other friends. But you just tell your, like, tell them to skip the last part of this episode. <laughs> yeah. Tell your bottom tier friends, too. Yeah. So thanks, everyone. Thank you all. You are the best. People are the worst. Robert is the worst this week. For real. Bye. Bye.